Friendship and the Common Good in Julius Caesar Dermot Cavanagh, the Review of English Studies, published the 13th of July, 2024. Abstract this essay proposes a new reading of Julius Caesar's account of friendship that also illuminates Shakespeare's broader communitarian political attitudes. It argues that the quarrel, or reconciliation, seen between Brutus and Cassius presents a crucial turn in the play's closely meditated account of amity. This sheds new light on Shakespeare's response to two classical sources, Cicero's De Amicitia and Euripides' Iphigenia at Aulius, whose opening provides the model for the sequence. The significance of how Brutus and Cassius settle their differences, as well as their refusal to believe the enemy is always occulted within the friend, has been underestimated. The high-minded ideals of Ciceronian Amicitia seem wildly remote from the play's exposure of how friendship works in political life. We witness it being made serviceable to ambitions and held in bad faith. Cicero acknowledges these possibilities too, yet the neglected later sequences of Julius Caesar tell a different story about friendship that emphasizes its role in promoting commonalty and reconciliation. The tragedy lies in the loss of this potential. For the Elizabethans, friendship was a public virtue. In Cicero's vastly influential De Amicitia, it is celebrated as the foundation of the common good because it offers the most immediate and practical experience of living selflessly. Friendship fosters a generous impulse to counsel and to deafen all manner of papal, sick, in the words of its first English translation, the reciprocal goodwill it engenders goes beyond personal relationships to nurture broader responsibilities, and that virtue shall not do if she estranged herself from the loo of the communite. Point one amity inspires the cooperation needed to preserve the common good, and, because it manifests how our well-being is inseparable from the welfare of others, it is the greatest gift to be enjoyed here in this common life among us. B4R.2 contemporary criticism has turned an unfriendly eye upon these sentiments, not least because they are so often envisaged in exclusively homosocial terms. 3. However, the period was equally preoccupied by opposing possibilities as well. What happened when friendship failed within a community, or was exploited to exacerbate the tensions it was meant to resolve? The consequences for communal life that could ensue are portrayed repeatedly in the tragedies of Shakespeare and his contemporaries and this is exemplified in Julius Caesar, 1599. These anxieties were doubtless sharpened by the fractious condition of the late Elizabethan polity, with its fierce and increasingly unmanageable political rivalries. Point four, the discourse of amity may dominate the play, but it is increasingly implicated in faction. 5. Once friendship is predicated upon and vitiated by the compulsion to extirpate an enemy, communal bonds fragment and political life degrades into a competitive struggle for power. Even the word friend, as Philip Goldfarbstite demonstrates, comes to denote tactical associations rather than personal attachments. 6. On the one hand, the friendships that compose the resistance to Caesar, descend into conspiracy, and prove susceptible to dissimulation and self-deception. Brutus and his patrician allies may proclaim their commitment to the common benefit, but they seem remote from, or even contemptuous towards, the Roman people. 7. On the other, their power-hungry opponents manipulate amity shamelessly. Marek Antony incites mob violence by appealing to the citizens of Rome as friends, and the alliance that he forms with Octavius and Lepidus barely conceals its internal rivalries. The conclusion to be drawn, for many commentators, seems self-evident. Shakespeare was simply cynical about politics. He was, or became, pessimistic to an almost Augustinian extent about humanity generally. Point eight. Yet this is not the only story Julius Caesar tells about friendship, or the only way it speaks to the troubles and pressures of its time. In particular, the resilience of amity amongst its doomed republicans has been neglected. This is part of a broader disregard for its later sequences. The play's first three acts now dominate critical attention. Yet this was not always the case, and some of Julius Caesar's most urgent insights can only be gleaned by reading and watching as carefully to its close. Despite the trials and ordeals that beset friendship, and that fissure the Republic, amity returns. Fresh light can be cast on this by reappraising the play's relationship to two classical sources, or resources, which enrich its principal indebtedness to Plutarch. 9. The first involves a reappraisal of the Amicitia. Far from being a tireless panegyric to friendship, Cicero's work acknowledges its vulnerabilities and the multiple temptations it confronts. It is concerned with the almost unendurable pressures placed upon those attempting to maintain integrity during a crisis. 
This many-sided exposition brings us closer to Julius Caesar's gradually unfolding insight into friendship. Far from being a mordant riposte to Cicero's idealism, the breadth of the play's account is in accord with its scope, and is better seen as intensifying, testing, and sometimes diverging from its emphasis. 10. The second classical source derives from the Greek world, the opening of Euripides Iphigenia at Aulis which provides, as Emerus Jones demonstrated, the model for the quarrel, or reconciliation, seen between Brutus and Cassius in its fourth act. 11. This sequence also deepens Julius Caesar's closely meditated preoccupation with friendship, turning it in a strikingly different direction to encompass not only the damage that amity can incur and inflict, but also its capacity for renewal and repair. The scene's power derives from its reversal of the coercive logic, that perceives the enemy as always hatching within the friend. For generations of earlier theatergoers and commentators this sequence equaled, or even surpassed, anything in its earlier phase, and these responses bear re-examination too. Furthermore, the shifting and unexpected role played by Amity in Julius Caesar, suggests another way of conceiving Shakespeare's political thought, beyond its pessimism or realism. The play does not simply anatomize the disorders that beset friendship, it also reveals the impulses and resources needed to overcome these. Brutus and Cassius begin their friendship again in full knowledge of their qualities and shortcomings, no less than their achievements, failings, and transgressions, and this reconciliation inspires a return to action. 12. Their example takes on compelling implications in a world careering towards a permanent state of enmity that forsakes any sense of the common benefit. It is through this revival of friendship, even in the most untimely of moments, that a more receptive response to its potentialities can be traced. The recovery of amity becomes central to the play's tragic recognition of what is lost when the virtues it sustains are dispossessed. Cicero in a wildly disconcerting moment after the killing of Caesar, his assassins claim that their action expresses true fellowship. Why, he that cuts off twenty years of life, Casco exclaims, cuts off so many years of fearing death, Brutus seizes on this thought, grant that, and then is death a benefit and hurries it to a conclusion, so are we Caesar's friends, that have abridged stroke his time of fearing death. Point one three. if the benefits we extend to friends include their murder, the virtue of friendship appears to be an irreparable disarray, Plutarch views the opposition to Caesar in both light and shade but commends their principal resistance to tyranny, Shakespeare's republicans are more compromised, 14 that said, the discourse of amity also exposes their opponents, when Mark Antony arrives at the scene of Caesar's slaughter, Cassius addresses him with a pointed query, Will you be pricked in number of our friends? Antony pledges immediate support, Friends am I with you all, and love you all, whilst requesting to speak over Caesar's body in the marketplace, as becomes a friend, 3, 1.216-30. His intentions glimmer within these concessive statements, as soon as he can speak freely, in soliloquy, his revulsion is made manifest towards these butchers and he determines to launch a pitiless civil war, 254-75-257. This is evidently not how friendship is meant to work, it is revealing that Brutus quashes any possibility of enlisting Cicero's support, 2, 1.140-52. In De Amicitia, friendship creates consensus between friends who are transparent to one another and who share the same altruistic motivations. 15. Although amity may bring worldly advantages, it may equally demand that these are foregone in accordance with the principle that all endowments are held in trust for the benefit of others. These insights stood at the center of early modern conceptions of community and the public good. De Amicitia was one of the earliest books printed in England, and received five translations between 1481 and 1577.16 The work also played an astonishingly key role in the school curricula both for language, learning and as the pivotal entry into moral philosophy. On the completion of grammatical training.17, yet Cicero's text betrays signs of its composition during the period leading up to and immediately following Caesar's assassination, 44 and 43 BCE, when its author seems to have been especially preoccupied with the relationship between friendship and political allegiance. Point one eight, the work largely consists of an imaginary dialogue set decades earlier in 129 BCE, and it begins with a melancholy acknowledgement of the ills of public life. Its principal speaker, Gaius Lelius, is a man distinguished by his friendship with the famous general Scipio Emilianus, whose death, it is strongly suspected, 
resulted from assassination, the discussion and reminiscences that follow are, in good part, a work of mourning for this murdered friend. Lelius recollects how Scipio gave deep consideration to the powers and predicaments of Amity. I am out for the lack of such a friend, he testifies, for his semblable as I trow in friendship was never A3V. The shadow of rivalry and political violence continues to fall throughout the work. Indeed, the dialogue is initiated by a further example of sundered friendship. The interlocutors express their shock at the enmity that has erupted between the tribune Publius Sulpicius and his great friend, the consul, Quintus Pompeius. The former fill at very aunts and at deadly hate with him. Sith he had lived with him in Greek nines of love, A1V. These cases teach hard lessons. In the competitive world of politics, loyalties shift and ambitions overcome scruple with troubling ease. At the same time, profound disagreements arise concerning the right course of action. Friendship may need to be revoked if it demands that a principle be violated. These dilemmas and risks are ever present, and Lelius warns that rescinded friendships are especially volatile. It happeth right oft that someone finds his expedient to one that is not expedient to that other and differences arise frequently in festive public, when friends vary in they repinions, b2v, in an astonishing admission, Lelius recollects Scipio observing that friendlyhood is subject to so many faults and pirellis, that it is not only theophis of a wisman but of a gracious man to flit, b3r, the fatality that gathers around amity intensifies when it is convened in terms of opposing aspirations, and the resulting paradoxes are seemingly insurmountable to resolve, 19 in its exposure of the temporality of friendship and the perils that beset it, Diamus issue expresses Cicero's tragic vision of politics, its idealism emerges from a context that threatens to engulf it, the incessant turbulence of public life could result in amity being entered into tactically, or with the expectation, that it would need to be discarded, Scipio thought that nothing was more full of enmity than, those, Wife said that a man showed love in such wise as if it happeth him sometime to hate in the same place. C1R. Temperaments and viewpoints change over time, and there was nothing more hard to be believed than that friendship might endure between twin unto the last lift days. B2V. When personal and political ambitions clash, men might set a greater value on worldly achievements as they pursue governments, sovereigns, power, and have endurance of goodness. These pressures intensified during a struggle for sovereignty because nature is too weak to flee the desire of power and worship and men, sometime for I eat friendship to attain to a greater octroite, C2R, given Scipio's eventual fate, there is a poignancy in his observation that it is passage hard to find very friendship in theme which Ben converse on in high courts or in Thazat public, C2V, if bonds of mutuality degenerated into rival followings, the consequence was a horrifying reversal. Off the wish strip most deadly enemite hath happed oft by tween theme wish have been most friendly, we should in our wise beware lest greet friendships torn themselves into greet enmities, B3R, C5VC6R, emphasizing this aspect of Diamisisha is a reminder of its sober and often disquieting realism, the principles it commends meet every conceivable challenge to their survival, yet, for Cicero, the irreducible core of friendship will always be recoverable. This insight is reinforced by the recessive time scheme of the work, as well as in its fulsome and compensatory exposition of its benefits. Friendship for so there's nothing else, but the knitting to jitter of that thawing that is goodly, and of that thawing that is humane with sovereign benevolence and cherite, A65. The long-dead interlocutors of De Amasitia may be haunted by their memories of loss, yet Amity also endures, unfeigned and unforsaken, producing insight and hope despite the severest tests. The friendship between Lelius and Scipio demonstrates that amity continues between the living and the dead and Scipio's wisdom, is transmitted, in turn, by Cicero as a gift of friendship long after its author's assassination. 20. The liabilities of classical friendship identified in De Amicitia, resonate strongly with those portrayed in Shakespeare's tragedy, perhaps as the residue of formative and systematic study given Cicero's pervasive presence in the grammar school curriculum. 21 however. These insights were doubtless further compelled by the rise of increasingly skeptical responses towards Ciceronian ideals, not least in the theatre. 22 Amity is the primary medium through which alliances are formed, persuasions are mounted, and decisions are made in Julius Caesar, but it is often surrendered for contestable reasons, made to serve sectional ambitions, and mobilized in bad faith. 
The long discussion between Cassius and Brutus that precedes the conspiracy largely concerns the duties of friendship, but it produces doubts and reservations that will prove fateful. Cassius begins, Brutus, I do observe you now of late, I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have, you bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend, that loves you. 1.2.32-6, this perception of his friend's altered gaze initiates a complex pattern of metaphors of sight, that express how amity can be acknowledged or disdained. Similarly, Brutus's hand should confirm their harmony of purpose, rather than signal their estrangement, his friend has adopted a posture towards him that is, simultaneously, and impossibly, both too forcible and too remote. Why the richly rewarding potentialities of amity had been forsaken is the question Cassius wishes answered. In response, Brutus admits he has become self-absorbed and neglected the reciprocity he owes to his good friends. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviours. But let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number, Cassius, be one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus, with himself at war, forgets the shows of love to other men. 1.2.36-47 Brutus's preoccupations have led him to slight the communal obligations and shared recognitions of amity. Cassius identifies this as a critical example of how openness and trust has been quelled in Rome. He too hath buried stroke thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations and this withdrawal into silent self. Communing is experienced as a physical affliction by all those groaning underneath this age's yoke. 49 to 50. 61. Cassius is advancing an insight that is central to Diamasitia, that it is through interrelationships that we come to know ourselves, an exemplary instance of how individuals depend on others to flourish. 23 Yet the play is equally alert to Cicero's realization of how political conflict disrupts this stabilizing pattern of mutually nourishing relationships. For Cassius, his impaired friendship with Brutus means that the latter can no longer perceive his hidden worthiness. 57 And this exemplifies the divisions and repressions incurred by Caesar's ascendancy. In his famously vivid accounts of witnessing Caesar's near drowning in the Tiber and, on a subsequent occasion, his epileptic fit. Cassius exposes the bodily and moral weakness of a man who now domineers over the Republic, and whose apparent offstage acclamation as king, punctuates their exchanges, 90 to 160. If they can arrive at a renewed and just recognition of each other's virtues, this will also provide the first step towards a broader restoration of the public good. This extensive dialogue on the intertwining of personal friendship with public issues, is one of the key sequences of the play, but it produces uncertainty. Cicero had warned against the artful cultivation of self-admiration, but suspicions arise when Cassius deploys forged petitions that will appeal to Brutus's pride, 314-19, and by his clandestine intent to work upon his friend's honourable metal, so that it may be wrought, from that it is disposed, 307-20 on a point 24, these techniques imply an intent to shape as much as to uncover Brutus's self. Cassius's impassioned appeal to all those who are born free foregrounds, the excessive entitlements accorded to Caesar's frail and undeserving body. However, this leads to a belligerent attack on the great Caesar as a sick girl whose coward lips speak of a feeble temper. This has led many commentators to stress the envy and spite that compel Cassius's apparently principled disdain for Caesar, his factional hostility towards an upstart who has revoked the customary prerogatives enjoyed by a traditional oligarchy. Along with the shameful feminization endured by a self-authorizing class of men long habituated to governance, 25 Brutus responses too are unsettling. He assures Cassius that if it be all toward the general good, his friend should speak of it fearlessly, set honor in one eye, and death are the other, comma, and I will look on both indifferently, I love, the name of honor more than I fear death, 1, 2.85-9. This slide from the public good to personal honor, or at least its name, is troubling, and the metaphors of sight and recognition, who is seeing and being seen, become entangled. Brutus is emphatic that he would not have Caesar crowned, yet I love him well. 82. It is this conflict between personal obligation and public duty that is resolved subsequently in a soliloquy that has provoked ceaseless questions, it must be by his death, and for my part I know no personal cause to spurn at him but for the general. 
he would be crowned? How that might change his nature? There's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that? And then I grant we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. 2.1.10-17. Cicero had acknowledged that friendship could be rescinded on the grounds of principle de amicitia. B3RB5V, C5VC6R. However, this question is taken to an extreme when a friend's life is to be taken for the public good, although Brutus's deliberation possesses all the hallmarks of an R argument in motion, there's the question, I grant, its blunt beginning appears to render its subsequent reasoning superfluous, it must be by his death, Brutus may simply be identifying the question he must address, but the ominous monosyllables sound as if a sentence is being pronounced, rather than stating a proposition for debate, 26 his way of identifying and then opening the question, he would be crowned, stroke how that might change his nature, intimates that the issue has been prejudged, he pursues it with phrasing which is largely abstract, Caesar is referred to solely by pronouns for 19 lines, although the action required is expressed by the verb to spurn, whose violent energy is difficult to contain within such dispassionate formulations, is Caesar an enemy of the public good? Brutus admits that he has not yet observed his friend abandoning reason or remorse, in the sense of conscience or compassionate principle. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power, and to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. 2.1.18-21, yet Republican thought on this question is recreated daringly with the assertion that kingship is an intrinsically corrupting office, preventing its emergence requires preemptive action, and Brutus affirms this by drawing on examples and analogies from natural history, that it is the bright day that brings forth the adder, stroke and that craves wary walking is a reasonable proposition, but it is also heavily loaded to confirm Caesar's malign nature, the thought again becomes entangled as it describes the danger of his poisonous sting, that at his will he may do danger with, is Caesar's essence being revealed, or is this being attributed willfully through metamorphic imaginings of his kind as a snake? the climber of the ladder, the serpent's egg. In any case, the action proposed for these eventualities, is not to observe caution, but to kill him in the shell, it is this leap from think him to kill him that turns a potential outcome into an inevitability by applying punitively deterministic categories. Brutus admits he can only hypothesize whether these conjectures will materialize, so Caesar may, but proposes that since the quarry or stroke will bear no color for the thing he is he will fashion it thus and impose judgment in advance of the available evidence. 2.1.10-34, Brutus's assessment and resolution of these probabilities is reached through involuted self-reflection, rather than collective deliberation. 27 Similarly, his expressed commitment to the public benefit relies on a tendentious extrapolation of evidence from common experience. This could expand to affirm friendship's primary obligation to the Commonwealth, yet this is not forthcoming. 28 The speech takes us further into the disturbed discourse of amity, notably so on the critical issue of whether a friend is a public enemy. The intense, effective relationship between Brutus and Cassius is the central concern of Shakespeare's play, but it discloses disquieting insights. Once amity founds itself on identifying an enemy, a sickness seems to arise within it, and this also compromises its expression between Caesar's friends. If Caesar's final speech is shocked by claiming unlimited powers that place him beyond the equality essential for a friendship, 3.1.58-73, his legacy precipitates the most formidable assault on amity. Marek Antony's funeral oration petitions the citizens of Rome as a community of good friends, sweet friends who are being addressed by a plain blunt man, that love my friend, 3. 2.203-13, this communal feeling is predicated on the reciprocal affection shared between Caesar, and the people as gentle friends, the primary political bond that Antony wishes to constitute. 141, the sensational reenactment of the assassination as a monstrous spectacle of ingratitude and betrayal, implicates all who share a common body with Caesar, I, and you, and all of us fell down with him. 189, this inspires Romans to turn on their enemies in the play's most pathological instance of civic violence. In the aftermath of Antony's oration, the poet Sinner is reluctant to wander forth of doors. 3.3.3 Sinner has been unsettled by a dream in which he did feast with Caesar, but feels compelled nonetheless to attend his funeral whilst being unaware that he shares the same name as one of the assassins. 
Sinner is soon surrounded and questioned by a group of plebeians. Sinner, I am going to Caesar's funeral. One plebeian as a friend or an enemy? Sinner as a friend. One plebeian tear him to pieces? He's a conspirator. Sinner, I am Sinner. The poet? I am Sinner. The poet? For plebeian tear him for his bad verses? Tear him for his bad verses. Sinner, I am not Sinner the conspirator. For plebeian it is no matter. His name Sinner. Pluck but his name out of his heart and turn him going. 3.3.20-22, 2834. In such tormented circumstances, Sinner's evasive wordplay is fatal. Even the most arbitrary association with the conspirators warrants death. 29 Mark Antony has created a sense of common purpose among the citizens, but only by inverting the interdependence and forbearance commended by classical friendship. The calamities that overcome friendship are central to Julius Caesar's tragic preoccupations in its first phase. A politics of enmity arises that diminishes a broader sense of the public welfare, and that creates opportunities for those who seize power to exercise unprecedented entitlements in pursuing enemies of the people. 30 However, its trajectory changes in its later sequences, as the play's Republicans find a way to renew amity in ways that counter, rather than mirror, the powers that are bringing them to defeat. This crucial turn in dramatic experience is initiated by the quarrel scene, shaped by the example of Euripides. Euripides, the acrimonious dispute between Brutus and Cassius, that dominates Julius Caesar's fourth act is now little noted, yet it overwhelmed those who encountered it for the first time. In the commendatory verses he composed for the first folio, Leonard Diggs singled out this episode as exemplifying Shakespeare's unparalleled gifts, or till I hear a scene more nobly take, comma, then when thy half, sword parleying Roman spake, and he returned to its enthralling effect in a later version of these lines that prefaced the 1640 edition of Shakespeare's poems, so have I seen, when Caesar would appear, and on the stage at half, sword parley were Brutus and Cassius, oh, how the audience were ravished, with what wonder they went hence, 3-1, Diggs recollects the half-drawn swords that threatened to bring this argument to a fatal conclusion, the wonder it elicited was perhaps intensified by these passions being overcome. The sequence continued to enjoy renown. 32 John Dryden chose it for the earliest discussion we have of any scene in Shakespeare. In his preface to Troilus and Cressida, 1679.33 Dryden's observations are still suggestive, and they are compelled by his intense interest in amity. He was deeply familiar with Cicero's and Aristotle's discussions of friendship, and equally preoccupied with its portrayal in both classical and vernacular drama. 34 In comparing Julius Caesar's quarrel scene with precedents in antiquity, and in acclaiming Shakespeare's scene as incomparably the best, Dryden noted its striking similarity to the bitter dispute that erupts between Agamemnon and Menelaus at the opening of Euripides's great tragedy, Iphigenia at Aulis. 35 Indeed, his admiration for this episode, and for its brilliant re-emergence in Shakespeare, led him to interpolate a similar dispute between Troilus and Hector into his version of Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida, 1679, and to imitate it in All for Love, 1678, and in the dispute and reconciliation between Dorax and Sebastian in Don Sebastian, 1680.36 Dryden remained fascinated by the unfolding of a scene grounded upon friendship, and the quarrel of two virtuous men, raced by natural degrees to the extremity of passion, which concludes with a warm renewing of their friendship. Point three seven, the esteem in which Shakespeare's quarrel scene was held endured for generations, even if the play evoked mixed responses. 38 Dr. Johnson found the work somewhat cold and unaffecting, but acknowledged that the contention and reconcilement of Brutus and Cassius is universally celebrated. Point three nine, the radical Hazlitt and the apostate Coleridge concurred in praising its masterly handling of the dramatic fluctuation of passion and the latter noted exuberantly that I know no part of Shakespeare that more impresses on me the belief of his genius being superhuman, than this scene. Point four zero actors seized on its emotional force and range. Thomas Betterton played the role of Brutus as a selfless patriot for nearly three decades from 1684 and, in his dispute with Cassius, excelled in conveying heroic resolution. His spirit flew only to his eye, his steady, Look alone supply the terror which he disdained and intemperance in his voice, should rise to, thus with a settled dignity of contempt, like an unheeding rock he repelled upon himself the foam of Cassius.41, it was most likely witnessing Betterton's performance as Brutus, 
that inspired the playwright and satirist Robert Gould to recount its mesmerizing effect in his encomium of Shakespeare, or when I hear his godlike Roman's rage, and by what just degrees he does assuage their angry mood, and by a secret art return the mutual union back to either heart. 42. Restoration tragedy indulged displays of virtuous exemplarity and the effective sentiment these generated. 43. Yet Dryden's penetrating consideration of amity in this scene led him to propose that its memorable display of tragic passion also contained significant political implications. T. He particular groundwork which Shakespeare has taken, he noted, is so memorable, because he has not only chosen two of the greatest heroes of their age, but has likewise interested the liberty of Rome, and their own honours, who were the redeemers of it. In this debate, point four four, this comment puzzled some contemporaries who could see little trace within a domestic quarrel of Julius Caesar's great questions of state. 45 However, this insight can be developed further by examining how Shakespeare did indeed model his scene, on the opening of Iphigenia, at all this, Dryden had assumed that parallels between Julius Caesar and Euripides were coincidental, but Iphigenia at Aulis and Hecuba were the most frequently performed and translated of all classical tragedies in the 16th century. Erasmus translated both works into Latin in an edition that was reprinted 20 times between 1506 and the end of the century. 46 It was the first Greek play translated into English, c. 1550-1557, in the remarkable version produced by Lady Jane Lumley, and it appears to have been translated again by George Peel, as a student at Oxford in the 1570s for a performance at Christchurch. It was performed by Paul's Boys in the same decade. 47 Shakespeare's access to Euripides was most likely through Erasmus's widely disseminated versions, although as Daniel Bollard comments, like other playwrights, Shakespeare would inevitably have absorbed the effects of Greek dramatic influence through contemporary friends, rivals, and colleagues including Marlowe, Peel, Johnson, and Chapman. 48 Iphigenia at Aulis begins with Agamemnon's agonizing dilemma, having taken an oath to support his wronged brother Menelaus by attacking Troy. He learns that the Greek fleet will remain becalmed unless his daughter Iphigenia is sacrificed. Agamemnon has agreed to carry out this appalling action, and Iphigenia has been summoned to Aulis on the pretext that she will be married to Achilles. However, Agamemnon has recanted and dispatched a messenger to forestall his daughter's journey. This emissary is intercepted by Menelaus who confronts his brother to denounce his mendacity and disloyalty. He accuses him of cultivating support for his leadership of the Greek forces only to become arrogant and remote, refusing the friendship of them. Wish had showed them Salus Freind later you are 4.49, instead of following the principled course of one who ought than to be more faithful to his friends, when that he is in place to do them pleasure, Agamemnon has shown himself to be self, seeking an indifferent to the honour of Greece, LL 316 to Ninetine.50 He exemplifies what happens when they do rule the Commonwealth which are unmeet for it, LL 359 to 60. In response, Agamemnon reproaches Menelaus with his subjection to a selfish passion, and argues that his earlier promise was worthless because compelled. He protests that he is now truly alone, alas I wretch horn or a friend, L 405.51 The dialogue reaches an impasse. How can a mutual care prescribed by Amity demand the sacrifice of Iphigenia? Agamemnon resolves that I must seek some other way, and get me other friends. LL 419-20 The brothers are about to abandon each other when a messenger announces the arrival of Iphigenia, accompanied by her brother Orestes and their mother Clytemnestra. This reverses the mood from acrimony to mutual sorrow. Agamemnon laments the intolerable shame. He feels at being exposed as a mortal enemy to his own child. Menelaus's resolve shatters in the face of his brother's anguish and pity overwhelms his earlier resentment. I pray you brother let me see your hand. L483. The sequence closes with Agamemnon's stricken realization that he will lose Iphigenia regardless. Their purpose will either be betrayed or his family will be captured and annihilated by the outraged Greek armies, if he decides to flee from Aulis. The brothers face this terrible necessity together. Why does this Greek moment appear at the heart of Shakespeare's Roman tragedy? Emerus Jones' answer turned upon its arousal of tragic sentiment. This was elicited by Euripides' characteristic technique of shaping dramatic sequences, so that emotional states were gradually intensified and then reversed a sensational effect. 52 Julius Caesar adopts this method as the contention between Brutus and Cassius gradually escalates until all self-restraint is swept aside. 
It is only then that the seemingly unstoppable impetus of the conflict is stayed, and reversed as the protagonists reach a new and unexpected understanding. They refer to each other repeatedly as brother. Indeed, Cassius is married to Brutus's sister, and grief at Portia's death also plays a critical role in overcoming their animosity. 53. It is worth stressing how much imaginative elaboration was involved in conjuring this episode out of a terse detail in Plutarch where the tempestuous reunion between Brutus and Cassius, with its movement from recrimination to shared grief, is recorded briefly, they began to power out their complaints one to the other, and grew hot and loud, earnestly accusing one another of and at length fell both a weeping point five four, the scene's expansive but unillusioned account of fraternity owes much to Euripides, and is in accord with the disturbed condition of amity already disclosed by the play, however, the rancor that emerges between Brutus and Cassius has a peevish, rather than an epic, character, 55 Diamasician acknowledged that justified rebuke was a responsibility of friendship, but it should be free from harshness or insult, 56 The emotional pitch of the quarrel scene lacks any such tact, although the dialogue involves free speech of a kind, it includes some uncomfortable reminders of the arrogance of Rome's republican oligarchy, it is not clear how much is solved at the end of the sequence either, their renewed resolve to oppose the enemies of Roman liberty, leads to further misjudgments on Brutus's part, that will doom their enterprise, indeed, the scene, as in Iphigenia at Aulis, descends into an intemperance so extreme that it threatens to vanquish Amity altogether, it begins with a mirroring of the opening dialogue between the two friends in which it is Brutus's turn to assess Cassius's diminished goodwill, Lucilius reports the subtle modification in Cassius's bearing, courtesy and respect are shown to Brutus's emissaries but not familiar instances, nor with such free and friendly conference, as he hath used of old, Brutus interprets this as signs of a hot friend, cooling, such enforced ceremony signals that love begins to sicken and decay, his haunting statement to a follower of Cassius, that his master has given him some worthy cause to wish, things done, undone, seems to reach beyond its immediate occasion, and the exchange that follows is laden with the burden of past decisions and actions, for, 2.6-21, the spirit of Caesar appears to return at the end of the quarrel scene, but his memory already dominates the reproaches of his assassins, as an unwelcome reminder of what they have become, as in Euripides, anger ignites quickly between the disaffected friends over the obligations and limits of fraternity, especially when it is entangled in a public cause Cassius Brutus hath rived my heart, a friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are, Brutus I do not, till you practice them on me, Cassius you love me not, Brutus I do not like your faults, Cassius a friendly I could never see such faults, Brutus a flatterers would not, though they do appear as huge as high Olympus, for, 3.84-91, the physicality of their reactions is expressed vividly, the surges of choler and spleen, the sensations of bodily distortion as of blood being let and vital spirits wept out through words, Cassius accuses Brutus of concealing wrongs within his apparently sober form only to be met with counter-accusations of dissembling and corruption, each presses for advantage in a spiteful litany of the slights, they have endured since their fateful action, Brutus fears that Cassius has become one of the hollow men, a thing of show and promise who will sink in at Ryle, this reveals either that his principles were held shallowly or, much worse, that the brotherhood he professed was always specious, Brutus insists that their endeavour should not involve immoral means, and that even opponents should be treated honourably, it was Caesar who sought to turn the Roman state into a criminal enterprise, did not great Julius bleed for justice sake, he asks an, if so, to tolerate bribery among their adherents, as Cassius proposes, is to sanction corruption, 4.3.18-28, equally, his refusal of mutual aid is compounded by the hoarding of rascal counters from his friends, 65 and 82, Brutus argues that such actions mean they have become unrecognizable to each other, 28 and 40, in response, Cassius asserts that his friend has simply forgotten the concessive spirit that should govern amity, and the familiar metaphors of sight and recognition return, 89, 96, Brutus should understand that compromises are inevitable in a crisis, when Caesar lived, he exclaims, he durst not thus have moved me, 58, the accusation is shattering, Brutus has exceeded his former enemy in willful imputation of fault, the tyrannous spirit they sought to exorcise now possesses his friend, yet the moment of reversal, as in Iphigenia at Aulis, 
is given extraordinary emotional weight, the scene's seemingly inexorable direction is reversed at the very moment when all seems lost, and the quarrel comes to the point of action. Cassius proposes that his friend join with Antony, and young Octavius in regarding him as an opponent who is hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, in an extraordinary gesture, he exposes his breast, and gives Brutus his sword with the instruction to strike as thou didst at Caesar. Cassius acts on the principle of self-sacrifice demanded by the general good. If he is its enemy, his life should be extinguished. In the face of this resolution, Brutus overcomes his anger with the same gesture found in Euripides. Sheath your dagger, give me your hand and the simple admission of fault. When I spoke that, I was ill-tempered too. The scene's intensity is then released by the entry of the ludicrous poet with his doggerel petitioning, love and be friends, and closes with a sharing of grief as Brutus discloses the horrifying circumstances of Portia's suicide. How scaped I killing? Cassius laments. When I crossed you so. 92 to 160. The significance of Dryden's observation, noted earlier, that Shakespeare had interested the liberty of Rome, and their own honours, who were the redeemers of it, in this debate, is released when it is located within the play's exploratory treatment of amity, in allowing for uninhibited expression, self-correction, and mitigation of impulse, Brutus and Cassius recover their friendship, 57a seemingly irreversible failure of self-control, is stayed by a more just estimation of the friend and, by overcoming sectarian entrenchment, Resentment is foregone so that dialogue can begin again on an equitable basis. 58. Brutus's surmounting of anger is consistent with the non-authoritarian impulse that J. L. Simmons detects in his behavior. This is demonstrated not only towards his social equals, but also in his ties of friendship and love with Portia and Lucius across the boundaries of age, gender, and status. 59. Indeed, Brutus's earlier dialogue with Portia, after the first clandestine meeting of the conspirators, presents a significant qualification of the play's seemingly unrelieved concern with masculine virtues. 60. This exchange prefigures the rhythm of the later sequence, in terms of anger being assuaged and misunderstandings corrected. Portia describes with striking frankness Brutus's self-absorption, and his impatient dismissal of her concern with an angry wafture of your hand. 2.1.245. Moreover, she rebuts any principle of subordination in their relationship by demanding instead, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate, and make us one, that you unfold to me, your self, your half why you are heavy, 271 for, as importantly, Portia claims this equality as a republican, Cato's daughter no less, whose constancy is demonstrated by the self-inflicted wound she endures as she speaks, it is this unforgettable appeal that releases Brutus into a new and enlarged understanding of their mutuality, thy bosom shall partake, the secrets of my heart, 304-5. Subsequently, her suicide provides the exemplary model of action for the male republicans at the conclusion of the play, a refusal to live enslaved as a subject in Octavian Rome. This bolsters the resolution of those poor remains of friends who choose to die together in a final assertion of liberty that signifies more than Octavius and Marc Antony, by this vile conquest shall attain unto 5.5.37-8. Point six one. It becomes less important, therefore, that Brutus and his circle do not articulate a set of propositions regarding the general good, given the growing emotional and ethical power of their commitment to living and dying as free, speaking citizens. Brutus's brief but emotive funeral speech over the fallen Cassius contrasts tellingly with Antony's earlier protracted exploitation of such an occasion. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. Five. 3.101 to 2.62, the Euripidean tragic sentiment that Emerus Jones identified in the quarrel scene also carries significant political implications that are intensified because of the context in which they emerge. In the preceding scene, Octavius, Lepidus, and Antony consolidate their hold on power by purging Rome of all those deemed to be political opponents. There is no tie of friendship or family that will protect these enemies of state. Your brother too must die can send you? Lepidus? asks Octavius. Lepidus accedes to this stunning demand whilst demanding, in turn, that Mark Antony's nephew be executed. The great friend of Caesar concedes with sickening rapidity, he shall not live, look, with a spot I damn him. 4. 1.1-6. to Yet suspicions are also emerging among the new allies, markedly so in Antony's dismissal of Lepidus as an empty ass, 
a property, 26, 40, despite Octavius scald in reply. So you thought him? Stroke, and took his voice who should be pricked to die stroke, in our black sentence and proscription? 15 and 17, after agreeing the terms of this settlement, Antony pronounces that now our alliance be combined, comma, our best friends made, but Octavius counters this statement with a bleaker viewpoint, we are at the stake stroke and bade about with many enemies, and some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischief. 43 and 51, this envisages a permanent state of war within the polity, demanding constant vigilance, where all can be considered as potential adversaries. Brutus and Cassius received the news of the resulting slaughter in Rome, whose victims include Cicero, at the end of their quarrel, 4.3.179, friendship and the common good The friendship between Brutus and Cassius has been subject to rigorous, sometimes a new yielding, scrutiny. In his history of the early modern passions, Christopher Tilmouth presents it as an exemplary study in self-delusion. The protagonists may conceive of themselves as rational, high-minded, and autonomous, but the play knows better by disclosing their irrational and self-seeking motives. Yet for a reading which associates Shakespeare with the skeptical fluidity of thought espoused by Montaigne, this leads to some strikingly resolved interpretation. Of the opening dialogue between the two friends, Tilmouth comments, Behind all of this, Cassius's actual motivation, unquestionably, is envy, not reason conviction, he espouses republican ideology only as a manipulative tool. Point six three on this account, the passions emerge as self-confounding forces which negate higher impulses, suspicion, resentment, ambition, envy, and guilt course beneath the surface of reasoned discourse. Yet Shakespeare's play gives significant weight to other potentialities of effective life which led to trust, mutuality, and resolution, those impulses that led beyond self-preoccupation and towards common purposes. It is through its portrayal of friendship as a commonwealth virtue, that Julius Caesar also spoke compellingly to its febrile political moment. In the last years of the 16th century, the conflict between the Earl of Essex and Elizabeth's leading ministers, William and Robert Cecil, had spilled out into public life to sensational effect. It was as if an enemy army suddenly became visible and both sides responded by throwing up barricades against each other, and by scheming to drive the other side from the field of battle. Unlike a following, a faction depended upon a rigid identification of those who were friends or enemies and looked towards winning clear political dominance over its rival. 64. The play responds to this context by depicting how antipathies can deepen in ways that breach the fundamental principle of concordia, an agreement on basic values in the face of disagreements on surface matters. Point six five Shakespeare's Republicans are entangled within an, in part, responsible for this crisis, and are subject to one of the deep concerns of tragedy that Euripides explored so movingly, the unpredictability of action. 66 Yet what can be learned from this experience does not lead in one direction. At critical moments, it proves possible to refuse the temptation to perceive the enemy is always occulted within the friend. 67 The virtue of amity had long been subject to skepticism, and sometimes ridicule, not least upon the early modern stage and Shakespeare shared much of the realism this involved. 68 The virtue of politics associated with Cicero's Doramasitia and Officiis had also come under increasingly disenchanted scrutiny in the periods. Drama 69 Yet Shakespeare's political responses are not always in accord with these emphases. If Shakespeare was not a Republican exactly, he was born and raised in the age of calm and wheel. 70 This was the primary framework of values in which the period's political thought took shape, and it was founded on the principle that the greatest and principalest good is nothing else but the public and common utility. 71 Cicero was a renowned exponent of this ethic and the English translators of De Amicitia render it in familiar terms. John Tiptoft translated Respublica as estate public, for example, C5V. Seventy years later, John Harrington's version of the Book of Friendship, 1550, rendered Respublica as Carmen Wheel, as in Lelius's insistence that friendship is owed to the public good in perpetuity, but truly I for my party, have no less care, what the state of the Commonwealth shall be after my death then what it is at this day. Point seven two, the extent to which friendship veers away from or accords with this larger conception of the public good, plays a crucial role in shaping the play's political insights. Shakespeare's attentiveness to the common benefit in terms of the conduct that sustains or diminishes it, 
further illuminates his ambivalent indebtedness towards the classical republican tradition within Julius Caesar, 73 on the one hand, the attrition endured by friendship arises from the unstable and deficient relationship of Caesar's opponents, to the common good, on the other, republican amity survives the challenges that expose these vulnerabilities, Brutus and Cassius's renewed friendship carries them decisively beyond private interests to engage again with the larger public responsibilities they share, their tragic fate dominates the play's closing sequence. 74 Viewed in one way, Julius Caesar is a series of conflicts over who belongs within the political community, and who should be excluded from it. The play reveals how and why these decisions get made whilst recognizing that these choices are neither inevitable nor equal. Copyright the author, S. 2024, published by Oxford University Press. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License, https colon, slash slash, creativecommons.org, slash licenses, slash by, slash 4.0, slash, which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution, and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Dermot Kavanagh, Friendship and the Common Good in Julius Caesar, The Review of English Studies, 2024, HG 038, https colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash res, slash HG 038.